Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending where you are from. Welcome to join this RSS webinar. Uh, my name is Yi Yu. I'm from University of Warwick. So in the RSS webinars, we call them webinars because they're online, but it seems everything is online now. So maybe it's just RSS seminar. So in these webinars, we usually revisit those RSS past papers, and uh, those papers usually have already proven to be impactful. And the topic today of this session is on dynamic networks. So uh, network type of data, they are of great interest due to the fact that a lot of data we're collecting these days from many application areas are of the type of the network. And the dynamic networks are those consist of sequence of networks. So in this session, we're honored to have two past papers on this issue. The first one, uh, the first one is from, from Kathleen and uh, Miele. And uh, we are very happy to have Catherine today to with us to 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 present this paper. And uh, the second paper is by uh, Matteo Berigosi and uh, Mark Allen. And uh, here Matteo is here with us today. Um, I'm also very honored to announce that uh, we have Ernst Witt from <coughs> Università della Svizzera Italiana. I promise I practice before still. <clears throat> so so Ernst is our discussant today and he will share us with uh, his insights through the whole session today. All right. So the structure of this webinar today will be first we'll have Catherine's talk and then it's uh, Ernst's discussion based on Catherine's talk and then Matteo's talk and then Ernst's discussion on Matteo's talk and then we will have a discussion or presentation from Ernst on some high level views of this area in general. And then we are open the discussions to the audience. So, so I guess we are all very familiar with this kind of format now, but uh, let me still say this. Uh, during the whole sessions, um, if you are not speaking, please could you just uh, mute yourself? And uh, when you are speaking, please, uh, please remember to, to unmute yourself. And uh, throughout the talks, maybe it's easier if you have questions, just you can type in in the chats and uh, uh, at the end, we will either read them out or you can just uh, raise your hand and I, I, I don't need to, to re-emphasize these buttons and you can just, just raise your hand and we can invite you to talk. Um, Another thing is uh, this talk is recorded and uh, after some editing at the end, we are going to upload to YouTube. If you have any concerns of the privacy or whatever, please do uh, email us for your concerns and we will make sure to accommodate your concerns. Um, right, I think that is probably all from me for now. And uh, Catherine, uh, it's your turn now. Thanks. I will present this paper on a, on a dynamic stochastic block model for analyzing uh, dynamic uh, snapshots uh, of, uh, of networks. It's a joint work with uh, Vincent Miel, and uh, as he already told you, uh, it has already been published uh, in GRSS. Yeah, next slide, please. So the, um, I will first uh, start with an introduction about contact network. You can go to next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Okay, so so the, the whole context of uh, contact network analysis is the following one. We will consider different individuals uh, that can be humans, animals, or even species, uh, a higher level uh, view of, uh, of interactions. And these contact networks, they, they might be uh, very different uh, in the way that they, they, they've been built. Uh, so, for instance, you can encounter in the literature uh, networks built from sensor-based measurements. And I will show you uh, an example of such a network uh, later in this talk. Uh, this can be for humans or animals. Uh, this can be also based on declarations uh, in survey. For instance, uh, in, soci in sociological network, uh, very often you ask some people to name uh, their friends and then the network is constructed in this way. Uh, it cannot also be obtained uh, from a field observation, in particular in ecology. Uh, if you observe uh, two different species at the same place within uh, the same uh, relative 
massive amount of time, say within a time window, then uh, you you might infer an interaction between those two species. You can also do that with uh, with cameras uh, that uh, take picture uh, when an animal uh, passes in front of it. Um, and in particular, a lot of uh, trophic uh, networks. So trophic networks in ecology uh, are composed uh, by species uh, that feed from other species. So trophic networks in ecology, they are built in this way. You know that uh, these species can uh, feed from this other one. And if you observe individuals from those species at a specific place, then you will infer this relation. Um, okay, so there, there are many different types of data. Uh, I, I won't enter into the specifics. Um, and um, the, those networks are constructed with uh, different aims. Uh, it might be to study the sociability or uh, in ecology to, to study uh, how the species interact uh, with each other uh, and with respect to uh, their environment. So the biotic and the abiotic uh, interactions uh, between those species. Uh, anyway, um, in this talk, uh, I will uh, try to have a very general point of view uh, on all these diverse uh, set of data. And in the following, I will consider that I have, say, n individuals, which are represented by nodes in the graph, okay, say n nodes. And um, these individuals, uh, they will uh, interact uh, either uh, with, um, with binary interaction, say, there's uh, presence or absence of contact between the two individuals in my network, or I can also consider, uh, say, frequency of contact, so weighted interactions, uh, for instance, uh, between those two nodes. So that those interactions will be the, the links, the edges from my graph, and I will try to, uh, to analyze this kind of data. Can you go next slide, please? Okay, so here's the, the type of data I will consider. You can see different snapshots of contact network uh, at different time steps. So the time interval can be very different. It can be hour, day, week, season, really depending on, on whatever the context. And uh, note also that it's important when you propose a model uh, to analyze such data that uh, the model be able to take into account the fact that individuals may be present or absent uh, at each time step. So what I mean is that, for instance, uh, if I'm studying species, uh, it might be the case that uh, some individuals uh, will die uh, during uh, the, the series or some other individuals will uh, will uh, will uh, give birth to, to other individuals. So in some sense, uh, I want to account for the fact that it's possible that some uh, individuals are not present uh, during the, the whole data set um, of, of uh, these interactions. Uh, but obviously, most of them uh, should be uh, the same. Okay, So I want to be able to account for small changes uh, in, the, in the individual set. And, um, and the formal definitions, then uh, I will consider T different time steps. Uh, and T is the number of individuals at each time, uh, at each time step, sorry. And again, the total number of individuals, uh, it's, it's small uh, with respect to the sum of different uh, numbers of individuals at each time step, meaning that most individuals should stay present across uh, the world data set. Otherwise, I, I cannot have uh, this uh, dynamic analysis of the data, OK? And uh, I already said it, but I want to reinforce the fact that uh, in this model, we will consider either binary relations, so presence, absence between uh, of the interaction between two, uh, two individuals, or weighted interactions, so absence or presence but, but with a weight, with a value uh, of the interaction. Okay, next slide, please. So the, the questions we're going to ask uh, are very general. And uh, the first one is, is there a social structure? So um, the, the idea behind that is that we, we want to understand if there's a peculiar non-random mixing of individuals that would be a sign for social organization. 
And if there is uh, sort of some uh, social structure in the data, we want to understand uh, its dynamics. And for instance, once we have that, we can ask questions about how does it vary with other factors, like for example, uh, seasonal changes, breeding season, response to stress, arrival or departure of, uh, of some specific individual, things like that. And uh, I won't deal with that in that talk, but also uh, studying the, the social structure of the network and its dynamics, uh, it's, uh, it can be useful to uh, predict uh, or, for instance, uh, infectious diseases will spread uh, in this network. Okay, next slide, please. So here we will focus on the first two questions. Is there a social structure? And uh, if yes, uh, what's the, the dynamics of, uh, of this structure? And uh, really what we want to do uh, in, this, uh, in this paper is uh, to, to move beyond descriptive statistics that are very often used uh, in particular in, in ecology. And, and we want to propose uh, a statistical model for the organization of the network. And to do that, uh, to, 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 to detect this social structure, we want to rely on, uh, on a clustering uh, model that uh, will capture the, the social structure on the nodes. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to, uh, to focus on the problem of clustering dynamic networks. You can move on, please. Okay, that's the general problem. Here I show you two different uh, networks at time T1 and T2. And you can see that uh, the, the individuals are essentially the same, but the interactions between the individuals uh, did change between time T1 from time T2. And here uh, the problem uh, is the following. So detecting uh, among the, the data. And uh, you can see in this data set that uh, in, the, in the first uh, graph, uh, the, the blue nodes, uh, they have become uh, yellow nodes in the second graph. So when you consider each graph uh, at a specific time step, you have the label switching issue that tells you that you can uh, relabel the, 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 the groups without changing the distribution. And uh, the, the major issue when you want to deal with dynamic uh, model uh, for clustering uh, graphs like that in a dynamic way, the, the, the main issue is to find a way uh, to um, define uh, what should be the correct uh, labeling of the groups through time. Because uh, if I had uh, drawn the second graphs here, uh, by exchanging the colors blue and yellow, say for instance, I would have a completely different interpretation uh, on the data set and on, uh, on uh, how uh, evolved the social structure of, uh, of the data. So that's really the point to emphasize here. You need to be uh, more careful um, with the label switching issue when you're dealing with dynamic interaction uh, much more careful than what you usually do when you look at just only one graph. Okay, so what we want to do is really to have some kind of smooth recovery of the clusters across time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so our contribution is in the, in the paper is the following one. First, we have proposed a dynamic stochastic block model. Uh, to, to uh, model this data. I will give uh, more details in the next slide, but just to show you the, the general contribution. So we have proposed this dynamic version of the stochastic block model. And uh, what is important to, uh, to underline is that our graphs, they might be uh, directed or undirected. It's really, uh, th that doesn't matter. Uh, you can do uh, the same things. And the, the edges of the graph, they can be binary or they can be weighted in which uh, case you just consider some kind of parametric distribution, the most suited to your, to your problem, and uh, the, the model uh, goes the same. And um, here, the groups and the model parameters, 
there will be a load to change food time. So, for instance, if the if the blue group uh, on the on the first um, graph uh, that I show you previously was some kind of a community, then uh, maybe in the second graph the blue group is no more a community. It can be a set of peripheral uh, nodes. So this is a load. But if you do that, you have to be very careful uh, on how you constrain the parameters in order to uh, to obtain a model that is identifiable. So you you should know exactly what you do if you authorize to um, to change both the groups and the, the model parameters between two different time steps. Then you should pay attention to the constraint on the parameters to obtain an identifiable model. And so we've done that. And then we've proposed uh, an inference procedure. So we've done this with a variational expectation maximization algorithm, a VEM algorithm. Uh, this VEM algorithm, it infers the nodes group across time and also the model parameters. And then with this inference, we can interpret the data and say, OK, uh, those individuals, they are organized in those type of, uh, of group that interacts in that way with the other groups. And a long time, uh, those individuals, they change from this group to this other group, things like that. And uh, we also have proposed a model selection criterion. So in fact, it's an integrated classification likelihood uh, criterion that will uh, help select the number of groups that we put in the model. Next slide, please. So that's the, the, the model, a simple uh, stochastic block model. So I start with um, the, the model described uh, in the, in the non-dynamic uh, setting, just the classical case, and in the binary case. And then I will explain how we uh, put the dynamics in there. So for those who are, who are not aware uh, of the stochastic block model, it's a very simple model where you observe a graph and you assume that you have two different latent groups, uh, which are represented here by colors on the nodes. And uh, there are uh, latent random variables, ZIT, that tells you what is uh, the color of the node I at time T. These are IID random variables. And what you observe in the binary case, it's just either presence or absence of an edge at time t between the nodes i and t. So that's denoted by yigt. And uh, the, the assumption behind the stochastic block model is that conditional on the latent, the zit, the yigt, they are independent and they follow just a Bernoulli distribution with a parameter beta. So beta depends on the colors of the two groups that you are going to link uh, and the time t you are considering. Next slide, please. So how can you generalize the stochastic block model to the weighted case? It's very simple. Uh, all, the, um, all the beginning is the same, except that now yigt is either zero, if you do not observe any uh, interaction between uh, the two nodes, or it's any kind of variable, let's say something in Rs. It can be a weight, so a positive uh, value, but it can be anything you want. And uh, what you will do is that for the, 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 the distribution of the observation conditional on the, on the group, you will put a parametric distribution. So here you, you use the mixture of a Dirac at zero for the non-existence uh, non of an interaction between any parametric distribution. So with the parameter gamma and now beta is some kind of sparsity uh, parameter for the, for the graph. So that's the setting for the static case. And now we go on to the dynamics. Next slide, please. And so for the dynamics, we just added on top of that a latent Markov chain. So now the, uh, the ZI, they are a stationary Markov chain across time. And so they, um, they help you uh, obtain a smooth recovery of the latent group because they, they follow this Markov chain. So they have a dependency through time. 
Okay, and in this context, what we want to recover is uh, pi, uh, the parameter for the, um, for the transition of the latent Markov chain. Beta uh, is the sparsity parameter of the graph. So in the binary case, it's just uh, the probability of connection between groups. And gamma is the parameter for the, for the weighted case uh, when you have a weight on your interactions. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So let me show you how it works uh, on simulations. Uh, first, I will show you some clustering performances. And uh, to do that, we have, uh, we have selected two different ways of looking at the, at the clustering performances. The first one is computing an adjusted run index. So that's a cl classical way of measuring uh, how you recover the, 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 the clusters up to the level switching issue. So the global adjusting, uh, adjusted run index, uh, it considers all the individuals and all the time steps. And in the literature, there was uh, another um, uh, a clustering, uh, perf uh, another measure of the, of the performance that had, had been proposed, which was the average RRI, adjusted run index, meaning that you only consider for each time step uh, the, the computed RRI at time t, and you average uh, the value over t. And there's a problem with that criterion because uh, um, it doesn't take uh, into account the problem of label switching between the different time steps. So it's easier to be good with average RRI rather than global RRI. Next slide, please. So here we have uh, a simulation setup with binary graphs, uh, 100 nodes. Uh, t goes uh, either uh, t is either five or ten, and 100 repetitions. We have considered q equal two latent groups and three different scenario for the transition matrix on uh, the latent uh, Markov chain. So uh, from p low to p i you tend to change uh, more often the groups, and for PI, you don't change very often the groups from one time step to the other time step. And we have also combined this with different scenarios uh, for the connectivity parameters, uh, which are measured in terms of easiness uh, to, uh, for, the, for the parameters to be recovered from the model. You can see in the, in the scenario medium, medium plus, the parameters are quite different, and in the scenario low minus, they are very similar, so it's more difficult. I won't discuss uh, medium with affiliation now. Okay, so next slide, please. And so the, the results are the following one. I won't uh, detail everything because I think I'm running uh, of time already, maybe. So I will be quick on that. Uh, the general idea is that uh, the, the clustering performances are good because you can see that um, when the scenario uh, are um, easier to recover, so from left to right, on the top row, you have the the T equal five uh, experiment setup. Uh, from the left to right, the scenario are uh, the, the easiest to recover. And you can see uh, indeed that from left to right, uh, the box plot of the values of the RRI, they tend to be uh, closer to one with perfect recovery in, uh, for instance, the I group stability. So when the, the Markov chain doesn't change, change very often uh, groups, and, uh, and um, the beta parameters quite easy to recover. So the, the method works. And uh, what we have shown with this experiment, uh, which I'm going to be a bit fast here, but I can explain if, if there are questions about that, is that um, the, the global IRI is really uh, the correct uh, measure to, uh, to quantify the quality of the, of the clustering recovery. And if you only used average uh, IRI, then you, you are doing a mess and you, you do not ensure that you correctly recover the groups across time. That's the message here. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we, we have also done uh, experiments on the model selection criteria. 
And um, uh, what we have obtained, uh, so without entering into the details, is that um, we, we recover the correct number of groups most of the time. And when we do not recover the correct number of groups, it's because, in fact, uh, the, the algorithm, the, the parameter inference algorithm, it did not converge uh, to a local maxima of the likelihood. And in fact, the, the, the classification uh, was not correct uh, at this point. So that explains uh, why sometimes the ICL criterion does not perform. Most of the time it performs well. And when it does not perform, the problem comes from the likelihood that, it, that is not correctly optimized. Uh, how much time do I have, um, please? Uh, so you, your mic, your mic is uh, you are muted. Sorry, uh, I, I guess uh, maybe just one, one or two more minutes because uh, okay, uh, yeah, then thanks. then I finish. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, just to show you on real data set, please next slide. Uh, what type of uh, of um, graphical view we can have on, on the analysis of this data set. So this is a, an encounter between high school students. The, the data is available at this website. So it's, uh, it's an experiment that, is, uh, that was made in a high school with uh, sensors uh, wear by the students. And you measure the encounters between them um, uh, during uh, four days here. And uh, these are the types of results that you can obtain. So here we have obtained four different groups on the data set. And you can draw this kind of uh, graphics where you can see the individuals well, at least from one time step to the other one. So you can see uh, here the, the four different uh, days uh, in column. And from one day to the other one, you can see how many individuals change group between those two days. So that's the interpretation of the turnover uh, between the groups. And in the, in the next slide, you can see, next slide, please. You can see uh, the, the value of the parameters. So here, what it shows you is that uh, the second group and the third group, if you look at the diagonal of this connectivity matrix, you can see that these groups, they behave as community with a high um, intra-group connection, uh, very low uh, connections with the other groups. The group number four uh, at, the, at the very end of this matrix it tends to be a community also, but with much more, much less within within the group interaction, and uh, the first group uh, doesn't interact a lot at all. Okay, and so in the next slide, we we have um, we have um, analyzed uh, this type of patterns, and we have compared this with the gender of the individuals, and well, we have a story that. Uh, seems to make sense. That's my message here. Okay, I will conclude because I'm really running out of time. I'm sorry for that. So um, please, next slide. Okay, so, so really the idea is that we want to have with this model a reconstruction of the group's evolution through time. That's really the point here. We control for the label switching issue between different time steps. We can model binary or weighted data set and we have a model selection uh, criterion to select the number of group. The package, the R package is available on the Chrome. It's called DIN SBM. Uh, I encourage you to try it on your data and some questions if you have some. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Uh, Ernst, I don't know if you have some... We will have a question from the audience, but uh, I don't know if you want to ask some questions first. Well, as we, as we kind of agreed, so I will just... I would ask questions if there are uh, no questions. So I think it's a good question that comes from the audience. So let me just ask that one. It's from uh, Alice Siberna, and he's asking... She's asking, to basically, can the model accommodate changes in the number of groups over time? So no, but it's a very good question. So uh, the, the, the model cannot do that. Uh, maybe we could modify it uh, a bit uh, to have, um, well, we could imagine uh, 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 that there's a value of the number of groups uh, that is global and some groups are uh, empty uh, 
uh, within the within some time steps. So it can happen, uh, but it's not specified like that in the model. But it can happen in the analysis that you obtain that at one time step one group is empty, and so it's quite the same as having uh, allowed a different number of of groups. Uh, if I uh, want to do model selection, for instance, with a different number of groups at each time step, then I think it's odd. I won't do that. <laughs> but it's a really good point. Th thanks very much. And uh, thanks, uh, Ale Alese. It's really challenging of my pronunciation of European languages. But um, anyway, uh, Matteo, it's all yours now. Thank you very much for inviting me to present this paper that actually we wrote some time ago. I had the chance to study my own work. Uh, uh, meanwhile, this is a joint work with uh, with Mark Callan. Uh, is is one of a series of papers that I did with Mark, mainly on the factor no model part, uh, that is uh, in uh, in uh, in the approach that I'm going to discuss. So. Very briefly, what do we do in this paper? Well, the kind of data that we deal are uh, volatilities of uh, Standard & Poor's 100 uh, stocks studied from 2000 to 2013, so including the great financial crisis. And the idea of using a network approach to study uh, interconnections between uh, 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 different stocks uh, comes from, uh, from a paper by Dibol and Ilmaz uh, in the Journal of Econometrics where they propose this long-run bias decomposition network, which is uh, a, a weighted directed network where each uh, link, the link between node i and j, tells us how much of the long-run variation variance of uh, uh, asset i is due to uh, um, asset j. Uh, and this is uh, this is why this is important. Well, because uh, uh, volatility uh, is a measure of uh, uh, of uh, of risk and uh, uh, measures of fears or lack of confidence, if you want. So, uh, studying volatilities uh, as as this meaning and finding a, a very interconnected network of volatilities means that there is a, a, a strong component of of uh, of, uh, of risk that uh, that is affecting all the stocks uh, in the market. Now, the approach by Dimon and Ilmaz was limited to very few stocks, about 20, if I remember correctly. But what we do here is to try to generalize this approach to a large dimensional system of time series. And by doing so, we need to face a series of, of, of technical problems, and uh, which we solve by using a mixture of uh, two of the most successful techniques for dealing with high dimensional uh, uh, um, panels, which are factor models, and uh, lasso type regressions, and I will say something uh, in a moment of why we need both of these things, uh, uh, in our opinion, to 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 study this problem. Now, um, uh, this this is a snapshot uh, of uh, of the result that that we get. So this is this is uh, a summary of this uh, this network, these long run variance decomposition networks. Uh, one studied over the whole period where we don't see much. Here there is some thresholding going on. I mean, the network we are estimating, I have to say, is not a sparse network. It's going to be a full network, but some links are more important than others. And so just uh, uh, by uh, some uh, uh, basic uh, uh, thresholding, uh, uh, we can uh, highlight which are the main features. I will discuss that a little bit more later. And what we see is that basically we see a cluster uh, cluster uh, structure where uh, colors of nodes represent uh, uh, different sectors. And you see that mm, mm, more or less the, the, there are two main sectors, the yellow one, which is financial stocks, and the blue one, which is energy stocks which are uh, connected uh, among each other but there are no connections across uh, across sectors or at least not appreciable uh, 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 connections while if we focus only on the period of the great financial crisis we see a totally different picture and there is a lot of interconnection that's the idea of the risk and the, the crisis that started from a specific sector which is the financial one and then uh, uh, eventually affected the most uh, of uh, of the real economy in the us and then also in the world but this is for for us this kind of data so how do we get to that picture um sorry now, how do we get to that picture? So what we deal with is a panel of stock daily returns. Uh, just to give you an idea of the dimension of the of the data set, we have 90 assets coming from 10 sectors uh, observed over about uh, 3,000 days. 
and uh, uh, so we are in a large NNT setting. This, this slide is to convince you that we have a, a curse of dimensionality problem if we want to apply standard uh, time series techniques. Um, so let's see the definition of a long arm variance decomposition network in the, the way Diebold and Ilmat proposed it which is basically uh, if you have a panel of uh, Y time series uh, then uh, and they are stationary, then you have a wall decomposition. Uh, uh, L stands for the lag operator. So this is uh, an infinite moving average, um, one-sided. ET is uh, a rotation of the innovations such that they are uh, orthonormal shocks. Why do I want them to be orthonormal? Because uh, uh, as, as part of the economies that I am, would like to attach uh, these, these uh, shocks, I would call them shocks, uh, and economic meaning. So at least they have to be uncorrelated among each other. Um, so there are different challenges if I want to apply this kind of model uh, to uh, a large data set. So where is the long variance decomposition network here? Basically, this is related to D of L, uh, actually to D at frequency zero, if you want. So the long run uh, effect of one shock to the component of Y. So the shock to component I affects the component J of Y through this matrix D. D will be uh, in a frequency domain observed at different frequencies. If we are interested in the long run, what we're interested in is uh, the zero frequency. And um, and here, well, um, the, 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 the crucial things are how do I estimate the vector moving average, uh, which is first of all is an infinite uh, object, so I will need to find an approximation. And second of all, this is a large dimensional object, so an autoregressive approximation will not work directly. And the other thing is how I do identify the shocks because what you get from estimation is not uh, in a set of orthonormal shocks. Um, once we have that model estimated, let's assume we have that, the long run variance decomposition network, as I said, is the, the, the sum over some legs of the squares of the entries of, uh, of that matrix. Uh, H in principle should be infinite. In practice, we will have to truncate at some different horizon, and therefore we have a long run variance where long run means uh, the horizon where I stop. So the cumulated effect uh, over all those steps. And typically we stop at one month because that's where the highest dependencies among volatilities are usually observed. And just renormalize from in such a way that uh, uh, the, 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 the weight of the network uh, satisfies some normalizing uh, uh, um, equations, okay? So that the sum over uh, a column is equal to one and the sum of all the entries of the matrix is equal to n. And then from that point on, we can just define the usual from and two degrees, so in degree, out degree, and uh, some measure of total connectedness, which uh, Dibo and Ilmat propose to, to sum all the degrees uh, across, across the, the network. Um, Okay, so what are the goals here? What are the difficulties? First of all, estimate uh, and invert uh, a large VAR. If you want to estimate the moving average, one thing way you can do is you estimate an autoregressive model and then you, you invert it. This is a classical approach uh, in, uh, in time series analysis. It has some issues of approximation, but I don't deal with this here. Uh, this is what Diebold and Ilmat do, but you cannot estimate a large VAR in a large dimensional setting because you have far too many parameters. So we have 90 series, so you will have 90 to the power of two uh, parameters to estimate roughly. So there are two main solutions here. Uh, and one is what would be a dense modeling strategy. So saying that the series have a factor uh, structure, so they are actually driven by fewer time series common to all of them with different kind of definitions of what common means. Here I have cited some papers which are the most relevant for our work. Or the other way to go is with the uh, lasso type or penalized regressions, and that would be a sparse modeling approach. And also here I have cited some papers in a specific context of VAR modeling. Lasso is applied in many different settings, but here I'm focusing on the VAR approach. Uh, now, um, actually what we think is that both features are present in financial markets because in financial markets you have global shocks which represent that part of risk which is not diversifiable across shocks that would be called the market risk but it can also contain macroeconomic factors something that comes and affects equally or at least in a pervasive way all the shocks and that is something that a factor structure will capture very well and this is known since uh, 
uh, long time, uh, and there is source list of papers here. Actually, Fama and French is not really what I have in mind because Fama and French have observable factors here. We have unobservable factors, but doesn't matter. The idea is the same. The other thing is that, of course, in the market there are also idiosyncratic shock. One firm goes bankrupt. What happens to all the others? That's an idiosyncratic shock because it comes from a single firm. Or one sector suffers of a, of a crisis. What happens to the other sectors? That's also an idiosyncratic shock affecting only a subset of the stocks that we have. That has more the idea of sparsity. That is more what we have in mind when uh, uh, people study the financial crisis using network, uh, uh, network approaches. Uh, and that part is related to the issue of systemic risk. So finding those systemic uh, systemic firms uh, such that if you hit one of these, then there will be a cascade effect hitting all the others. And uh, there's not much diversifiability that that can take place here because uh, uh, if you have uh, in your portfolio that firm that uh, is something you cannot diversify away if it is systemic by uh, uh, buying stocks of others. Um, what we think, and actually now I cite a paper that was not available when we, uh, sorry, here I have some Dropbox <laughs> notification. I should have stopped them. Anyway, I cannot stop them now. Uh, there are some, uh, some. Um, there was some a new paper by Giannone Primiceri and Lenza, uh, which is, uh, I think, still unpublished, but it's very interesting. And they consider different economic data set and they try to establish whether they are dense or sparse uh, with the idea of which would be the best technique to uh, study them. And uh, their main message is that economic data are more likely to be dense rather than sparse. Now, this is debatable, but what we believe and what has been found on this kind of data that we analyze is that dense and so factor structure is something that is important. So. The main message would be, first, you have to control for common factors. The second challenge is that identification of the shocks, but I don't think I have so much time now to discuss this, so maybe I can leave it to questions later on. Um, so the idea is that our panel of time series will be driven, uh, will be following a factor model as written up there. So Y will be divided into a component X, which is driven by few white noises, UT. These are Q-dimensional, where Q is much smaller than N and load it dynamically with the filter B, B of N. And then there is some idiosyncratic component Z, which uh, will contain all the dependencies that are not driven by common factors. Now, there are a lot of technicalities here, how to disentangle the two components, but the main message is that in the limit that the number of cross-section of cross-sectional units goes to infinity, you are able to disentangle the two components with some sort of principal component, although that's not directly the thing we do because there is some dynamics there, but the intuition is principal component that allows you to separate the two components. And in the limit of friend going to infinity, that is to say in practice in large data set, you can separate them very well and then analyze them separately. So this is a divide and conquer strategy that we are proposing. Um, okay, so once we have the idiosyncratic component, then on that we can uh, try to use the Diebold and Ilmatz approach to say, okay, that will have a world decomposition because it's stationary, that's, that's, that's given. And uh, we had an assumption which is saying, okay, it follows a sparse VAR, uh, and uh, which is sparse not only in the coefficients, but is also sparse in the covariance uh, of the residuals, which for some reasons we parameterize using the inverse. Don't have time again to enter the details, but uh, that's the idea. And sparseness makes sense in the idiosyncratic component, while it doesn't make sense on the raw data. That's that's the main message that we wanted to convey. Also, one of the main messages we wanted to convey with the, with this paper. Uh, and now, then, once you have Z, you can you can use uh, your preferred lasso method to uh, find F uh, and to find C. And once you have uh, F and C. Uh, you're basically able to recover the moving average representation here. Where C would enter, would enter in identifying the shocks because that would be the covariance of the innovations and the covariance of the innovations then can be used to uh, rotate them in such a way that they satisfy some certain identification constraint that you would, would like to impose. Uh, now, mm, as I said, I'm skipping through some slides because I don't have enough time to enter all details, but I'm happy to discuss them later on. Uh, uh, there is an additional, uh, so uh, e, how much time do I have? So just to see what can I skip or shouldn't, or can I spend some time? 10 minutes. 
10 minutes. Okay, so I can I can say something a little bit more about identification then. So uh, once we have estimated the, the VAR, we have some uh, innovations V here, and uh, these are in general cross-sectionally uh, correlated. They have a covariance matrix, which as I said, I'm parameterizing with the inverse, so it's C to the minus one. And uh, um, so C is the inverse uh, uh, covariance. And um, um, Okay, we would like to, to have an identification here. So uh, one identification, which is the one considered by Diebold and Ilmatz, is to find the ranking between the nodes uh, uh, such that there are, uh, so um, um, that, that would be a Cholesky, uh, the composition of the covariance matrix. So Rn would be a triangular, lower triangular matrix such that your covariance satisfies R, R prime. And uh, and this uh, will uh, will give you uh, orthogonal shocks, uh, ortho orthonormal shocks if you normalize. But the important thing here is that they are orthogonal, and uh, and this will allow you to clearly see the effect of a shock to a, to a to a to a stock on another stock. Now the issue here is that this identification and the choice of R depends on the ordering of the nodes, as we all know. So how do we pick the ordering? Well, here, just to keep the, there are different approaches. There is the Dibble and Ilmatz, which has a sort of generalized approach where uh, it's, it's sort of taking into account all the orderings, okay? Uh, that, that, that's one possible approach that we tried. It gives similar results, but since here it was all about networks, we said, okay, there is a network structure also for this innovation. What, did, what does it represent? It represents the par something related to the partial correlation between two nodes given all the dynamic dependencies. So conditional on the dynamic dependencies, this is the residual uh, contemporaneous dependence. And so the idea is to find some measure of centrality based on, on this, on this, uh, on this, uh, 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 was this inverse covariance matrix, uh, such a way that tells us which is the most important node, which will be the first one affected and then uh, how this will propagate to to all the others. So that's that's the idea. I've really roughly explained that there are some some more details that uh, that I don't have time to enter in. Uh, so uh, basically, like this, the most contemporaneously interconnected node will be firstly uh, is is firstly affected by an unexpected shock. And then by means of subsequent uh, impulse response analysis, which is this D of L matrix that I'm considering, we study the propagation of such shock through the whole system. So um, that would give the idea. There is estimation, I would say a few words. The, the other mm, issue is uh, volatilities are not observed, but we have a factor approach starting from returns to extract volatilities in a multivariate way. Uh, now, uh, I have, as you see, uh, two papers that are previous to this one that I'm presenting that were published with Mark and a very recent one where we have some more uh, asymptotic theory on this approach that was just published uh, at the beginning of this year. So um, I will not say more, but uh, now we also have some uh, some. Uh, 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 theoretical uh, basis for what, what we've been doing. Now, um, so starting from returns with the first uh, factor model approach, we can generate a panel of volatilities, which is all explained here, but I skip and I go to estimation in one slide. So say that we have the volatilities uh, and then uh, we can uh, estimate these generalized dynamic factor model on volatilities, uh, obtain shocks uh, uh, on volatilities, so this would be part two, uh, common shocks uh, and idiosyncratic shocks. Uh, and then uh, on the idiosyncratic part, uh, we fit the sparse VAR. Here there are different uh, approaches that we tried, elastic net, group lasso, adaptive lasso. They all give, and there are other, other possibilities that are cited here. Uh, and uh, they all give uh, uh, similar results, not the same ones. Of course, there is an issue of how to set the penalty constant here uh, and uh, and all these things. Uh, and then uh, what about consistency of all this approach? Well, I can say that doing uh, the GDFM uh, estimation, so the factor model estimation on returns and then on volatilities, as far as it concerns finding consistently the, an estimate of these idiosyncratic components, and uh, uh, an estimate of the common shocks uh, uh, that uh, is consistent as an antigo to infinity as we proved with Mark is not an efficient approach because it's a multi-step approach, but still it works. 
And uh, using the adaptive loss on a large VAR is something that has been studied in different papers. Uh, I also have a paper, so I advertise my own, which was also published later on, uh, where we where we show some some uh, uh, consistency result on that. Um, now um, let me skip to the to the results. So we do have everything. We have uh, uh, so we start from closing prices at each day. We compute returns uh, by taking uh, uh, growth rates, and then uh, we manage to extract log volatilities uh, with a certain approach. Now, why log volatilities? Well, that's the idea. Uh, typically, if you want an additive model, uh, you have to take logs because uh, otherwise there will be also the issue of uh, positive. Uh, uh, so the factor model is, is an additive model, so it cannot be really used for only positive variables. So typically we deal with log volatilities, which is in line to what with Diebold and Ilmat did, where they fitted a simple VAR on these log volatilities. So again, they used logs. Uh, they also say that log volatilities are close to Gaussianity, which puts you uh, in, in, a nice, uh, in a nice setting, but also on that we can debate, uh, of course, uh, uh, if Gaussianity is there or not. It's not really there issue here, however. Um, data are not standardized. I, I underline this because usually in PCA you do that, but we shouldn't do it because they are all measured with the same unit of measure, which is uh, uh, daily returns, uh, and therefore uh, that's how it is. And if some uh, some asset has, has a more important uh, uh, weight, that should be respected in the, in the definition. How to find the number of factors? There are different ways. One way is looking at spectral densities. Uh, again, uh, there are things that we could say, but here what I want to stress is that Common shocks explain about 40% of the total variation in log volatilities, which is quite a lot because it's just one, but still there is a 60% uh, amount of total variation that still needs to be explained and that we analyze through this sparse VAR. This is the effect of global volatility shocks. So the factor part, that is the percentages of the 20 step ahead forecast error variances due to the global shock, this is just one. And we see that things do not change so much between the whole sample and the crisis sample. Uh, the, the two most exposed sectors are financial and energy, but also others are quite, quite uh, affected. And this gives you an idea of how the, the global shock are pervasive across all sectors because they are common to all sectors, because they are common to the market. Okay. Uh, and this is uh, a graphical representation of the coefficients uh, of the VAR. Um, this is this is clearly uh, 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 this, this. We did it for p equal five. So this, uh, honestly, uh, I think this is only for p equal one because this is just one matrix of coefficients. So. Either either we 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 already sum them uh, or sorry I don't remember this uh, honestly this I, <laughs> I forgot to check again. Uh, anyways, the idea is that these give the dynamic dependencies uh, in the, in the in the VAR setting, uh, uh, which is some people have called the long run the, the Granger causality network. But uh, whatever, I mean, uh, this is these are the dependencies and there uh, uh, this is the approach with elastic net because this is the benchmark result that we used. And what we really notice is the, the increase of density in, in the crisis with respect to looking at the whole sample. And uh, here I highlight uh, a part of the stocks. So this square here would be financial and this would be energy uh, uh, stocks. And as you see, there is more within, uh, within connections during the whole sample, while here is more uniform, the, the, the approach. Uh, this is what you would get with group loss, but of course, because why this big difference? Because uh, with elastic net, we didn't penalize, we didn't give much weight to the sparse component. That's an, uh, a weighted average between an L2 and L1 penalty, and the L1 penalty was not given a big, uh, a big uh, weight. And the reason is that. In principle, we have we don't really want to have too much sparsity. We just want to regularize in such a way to be able to estimate the VAR and invert it. The sparsity also in the idiosyncratic component is something we can assume, but who knows? I mean, what we know is that there are weak dependencies. Okay, so we can allow for part of it. Group plus, so, uh, where the groups is across legs uh, in such a way that the shock hits at the t minus two, it will hit also at t minus one and at t. Uh, and not with some strange things, uh, but the main message of the variation in the density is still there. Now, this is for the idiosyncratic innovations and how we find, uh, how we identify them. We can look at the 
partial correlation network uh, in the in the idiosyncratic uh, innovations and uh, and then look at some measure of centrality you can see these these two graphs as really sparse networks uh, where there are, uh, each dot is a link uh, and then you can see that definitely the most connected ones and so the most likely to be central are again these two sectors uh, and this will be the the guideline for our our um, identification here is the ranking that we get uh, based on the previous graph for the two different samples and uh, what happens is that basically the financial uh, uh, firms are always the most central especially during the financial crisis these are all financial firms uh, up to basically all of them except the last one so uh, the long run virus decomposition network, which is just the inverted VAR with the, with the with the identification that I mentioned of the shocks, is a full network. But clearly, it is a full network with few uh, important weights and many others which are very close to zero. So the gray ones are all below the 95th percentile in the distribution of the weights. Um, and then uh, and then you have different uh, different uh, uh, colors for the remaining uh, uh, right tail of the distribution. And we believe these are the most important ones. Uh, and uh, here with numbers, the same thing. Uh, um, and well, the main message is always the same. So basically, then with some thresholding, which uh, I realized was not very well explained in the in the published paper, but I'm happy to discuss it uh, again. Uh, um, and uh, in the replication codes that we made available, there are some some explanation uh, which should be more clear. You can also visualize a sparse uh, network, which which helps in in having an idea of what's going on. But the the main result uh, should be should be in something related to this and the idea that the red ones uh, that the 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 the, 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 the during the crisis basically there is a lot of more interconnection among among stocks um okay so um you can see a vector centrality of the previous uh, previous networks once you once you have the 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 uh, the, here there is the ranking of the stocks, and again the the, the, the center, the, the Bank of America, AIG, Citigroup. These are the those that were heading the news uh, at the time, as the the the, the institution having more most troubles, uh, uh, not surprisingly, end up being the most central uh, central in the network. So then we can study uh, connectivity among sectors, uh, and uh, I think uh, I think uh, I'm I'm done with the time because it's 4 p.m. So I just want to leave some time. For, for discussion. So here, this is, this is a summary, but uh, I guess we can stop here. Maybe should I share my screen? Probably better, right? Um, maybe, maybe just just for Let's see. For four minutes. Uh, Ernst, do you have some questions for, for Matteo? Yeah, yeah, I I do. I mean, maybe you can even share your screen. So uh, oh, sorry, yes. uh, just the, uh, the first well, I may, maybe That's just fine. ask a question about the fact that you have uh, quite a number of different uh, networks uh, yes. that you actually, in some yes. sense, are inherent in your in in your approach. So you have mm -hmm. the uh, well, there's the VAR network, which basically mm -hmm. is the uh, the idiosyncratic component, as you mm -hmm. call it, mm -hmm. uh, which you actually estimate in a sparse way. So basically, mm -hmm. it is a yeah. network. Yeah. Uh, then you have the um, the exactly. And mm -hmm. so uh, then there is the PCN network, which is mm -hmm. basically the partial correlation network that you have yes. for kind of instantaneous uh, interactions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then finally you have the, well, what you I call the long range um, variance decomposition network. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and that's the one you kind of focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could you maybe just explain why of those three networks that you have, this is, do you think is economically um, the most relevant one? Uh, yes. Um, well, uh, there is a marketing issue here because at the time and uh, at the Dibol Daniel month was the one uh, that everybody was using. So, uh, but but we believe that it it it, it makes sense. Because it's it's strictly related with the idea of impulse response analysis, which is something that uh, economists like to do. So the idea of an expected shock hitting a system and seeing how it propagates in the system. This is something that is done mainly in macroeconomics, where these shocks are attached to a label like monetary policy shock, fiscal shocks. Uh, uh, but 
the idea is always the same. You start with the moving average, you give a structural interpretation to, to the innovation, so you rotate them in, such, in a certain way, and then you see how dynamically they do affect the whole system. So uh, to keep the analogy, I think this, 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 this makes sense from this point of view to see how much of the, the variance can, uh, can a shock to, to asset uh, A, uh, uh, how much of the variance uh, uh, of asset J is explained by a shock hitting asset, asset I. That was the idea. But of course, uh, this is no more dynamic if you want, because we collapsed everything in the long run. So definitely the, the VAR network uh, is more dynamic in this sense because uh, it, it, it tells you at time t minus one happens this and at time t will uh, affect uh, the other one. So uh, actually I believe that all the three are, the, the, are important. If I remember correctly, when we started writing the paper, we wanted to give the equal weight to all of them, but then it was becoming too complicated. So we decided to focus on the final product and use this as byproducts. But uh, um, I did actually here, he cited a work with, with Christian Braulis where we did the other two together. And actually we estimate the two together, not one after the other, okay? In, in a unique algorithm, you can estimate the whole parameters of the VAR. So uh, there, is, uh, there is something important there as well, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, but uh, I think the idea is going coming from macroeconomics and brought here using the impulse response kind yes, of interpretation. Response. Uh, yes, interpretation. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Good. So I don't know if yes. there's any other questions from other people in the audience. That there is one. Okay. Yep. Maybe you can read. Okay. Yeah. The level. Of, yeah, I read it. How would you measure the level of contagion on the whole market? Um, well, <laughs> one has to define what contagion means. Uh, uh, you can uh, look at the whole connectivity measure of the whole network. That would be a, a, an aggregate measure. So where were the definitions that we had at the beginning, really, of the presentation? Here there are, uh, so this measure of total connectivity, uh, gives you, uh, I mean, this you you end up having just a number, and and if it is not time varying, the network doesn't tell you much. But you could do this uh, this this exercise with the rolling window, and actually with Mark still uh, last year we also did the locally stationary approach to the to the GDFM. So you could use that and see how this measure of total connectedness changes. So. This is this is one way directly taken from the network. You just uh, sum all the weights basically. And uh, and uh, that would be an overall level of contagion. I think it is more important to see also um, how single uh, how clusters form. So a cluster analysis would be meaningful probably here, uh, but we haven't done that. I don't know if uh, if this can be like an answer. Sorry, I have problems. Okay, yeah. Right. Thank mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Matteo. Before you start, how about let's shorten the last bit of time and you, you still take your time, but before your talk, maybe we just uh, answer one question from the floor, which was like a half an hour ago. Uh, that's, how, that, that, that's for Catherine. Uh, Catherine, I don't know if you... Catherine. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I've seen the question. So so the question was about uh, if I, if we were able to include external inputs into the, the dynamic model. So so that's a good question. In fact, there are a stochastic block model uh, in a static uh, context that include covariate uh, in the model. Here we did not do that, but uh, it's doable uh, exactly in the same uh, way as you do a static uh, SBM with, uh, with covariate. It, then you you just add the dynamic, and and the, the question uh, when you want to put covariates in in a, in model like that uh, is whether you want uh, that the clustering uh, is explained by the covariates or rather that you want a, a clustering uh, once you have taken into account the information uh, given by the covariate. So the, these are two different type of modeling and it really depends on the data set. So we did not do it uh, because it's not generic and uh, et cetera, but it's doable, yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Ernst. I think it's all yours now and we can definitely shorten the last chunk of time. So take your time. Thanks. Okay, good. Uh, yep. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm very pleased to be able to kind of give a, a short discussion of the the two two papers that we've seen. Um, 
they are in some sense very different papers, but they kind of fall into uh, the kind of typical uh, kind of split that you can get when you look at dynamic network processes. Um, so what I uh, suggest is that there are kind of the three different ways of looking at dynamic networks. Uh, and given that the terms networks uh, is used so often, it's sometimes hard to see exactly where uh, certain types of, uh, of contributions actually fall. Um, but the, uh, the first one is, is the one that actually kind of uh, Catherine was uh, presenting, which is a type of uh, uh, network that is dynamic in the sense that the actual network itself, the edges are changing and are developing. Um, so what you see is that uh, links appear and disappear, um, whereas the kind of the talk that uh, uh, by by Matteo in the second case was uh, an, a different type of, of dynamic network in which actually the thing that is in evolving are actually what is happening itself. Um, and the idea of network is typically an inferred type of uh, relationship, which is typically something uh, as a, a correlation, a partial correlation, or, or something else. Um, then the, the third type of network, which is uh, uh, not mentioned explicitly in this presentation here, uh, but I have the, the main reference by the author's COVID at all, uh, which uh, actually is, uh, no, that's just a joke too, actually. These are the dynamic evolving processes on top of a kind of a network. The net network could be stationary, but what you actually see is uh, uh, that uh, the process, which could be infections, could be delays in uh, traffic networks, um, which actually just represent a kind of a, a process on top of a network, and the process itself is dynamic, whereas maybe the, the network itself is static. Um, so just talking about the uh, the first type of network, which is the uh, the dynamically evolving edges. Um, so actually, I think there is two ways that, uh, the, well, the important bit is to kind of look at the types of edges that are uh, considered typically. Uh, in the case uh, of Catherine, she was talking about what I call maybe intermittent types of edges. So these are edges that are there, they persist for a while, uh, they then could kind of disappear. So think of friendship types of networks uh, that uh, where a friendship is made, uh, then lasts for a while and then disappears, um, and then maybe reappears again. Um, I mentioned a couple of models that are used in order to analyze these type of networks, like the uh, exponential random graph models and stochastic actor-oriented models. Um, but uh, another type of network, which is um, uh, very similar, but basically where the edges are instantaneous, uh, are things like email exchanges, bank loans, uh, which are basically kind of instantaneous links between um, between um, between nodes, uh, and they just basically appear in a kind of an instantaneous moments, then they disappear again. Uh, but basically, there is this dynamically evolving pattern of uh, of kind of appearing and disappearing edges um, of instantaneous edges. Uh, the sampling of the network, well, clearly, uh, if you have the, the type in which you have instantaneous uh, edges, you either need to kind of record the timestamp at which these type of events uh, occur, um, or what you could do is basically just accumulatively count them and basically uh, sample them in kind of fixed intervals in which you then kind of report, let's say, the type of uh, the sum of the intermittent edges that you might have observed over a certain time interval, the number of emails received or sent between I and J um, uh, over a certain interval. Um, or uh, the type of uh, sampling that uh, that Catherine was talking about, which is kind of snapshots uh, in which you actually sample at fixed time intervals a certain and then observe the kind of uh, the edge uh, as well. Now, um, this, this was the kind of motivating example that she gave. Uh, I actually have the no, I have the feeling that obviously also other types of models, maybe of the first type actually, are also able to be modeled uh, by the type of setup that she has. Uh, but nevertheless, no kind of motivating example was this. Um, so uh, in, in the paper, uh, the idea is to kind of do um, kind of clustering. 
And now clearly clustering is uh, kind of a very natural kind of tendency that uh, that we statisticians uh, seem to suffer from. We, we like clustering, uh, but not only us. It, it, it does give us kind of a, a, a nice um, semantic meaning to what is going on. If we are able to stick labels on certain things, we, we can refer to uh, individuals by their group label. Um, and so it's uh, it's also especially in in networks where there's a lots of um, basically in large data sets where there's many things going on. Uh, labels are are typically useful ways to kind of summarize uh, what is what is happening. So clustering tends to be natural, but but that actually becomes really uh, to some extent already problematic as soon as you start to go to uh, dynamic networks. Now in the um, presentation uh, was mentioned briefly uh, as label uh, switching, uh, but Clearly, there are uh, identifiability issues when it comes to kind of labels uh, that kind of change over time. Um, and 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 if labels were to change, or if you were to allow to change labels changing dramatically, you get indeed in this kind of label switching problem. On the other hand, if you do not allow to uh, labels to change dramatically, it may actually not represent what is actually going on in the underlying social uh, realm. Uh, so if you do not sample in fr frequently enough, it may actually be the case that, that certain types of, uh, of elements have actually uh, changed groups dramatically. So uh, identifi identifiability is crucial uh, in order to make sure that clusters make sense, but, but to what extent do we need to, uh, are, which constraints are actually needed? So the other couple of points that I'd like to mention uh, briefly is the idea of uh, Bayesian versus frequentist paper uh, presents um, a variational EM approach. So it's a kind of, let's say, frequentist approach to do uh, estimation in this model, uh, whereas actually most or actually typical, a uh, lot of stochastic uh, block model papers actually rely on Bayesian approaches. So what are the advantages of uh, VEM over base? Um, um, maybe this can be uh, discussed. Uh, again, identifiability. Now, just want to mention that the actual paper itself is published in 2017, but in 2018, I believe, uh, an update appeared uh, about, indeed, some additional uh, ways of talking about identifiability of this particular uh, setup. Uh, and so, clearly, uh, it is very, uh, in order to, to describe this carefully, uh, uh, there is quite a bit of detail that is hidden behind uh, the presentation itself. And um, so maybe we can talk about what are the main issues when it comes to uh, identifiability. Um, the last point, extensions, uh, maybe just to mention that uh, the extension uh, that I, I've kind of already mentioned, there is a kind of a, the fact that could it be possible to, to uh, extend this type of model, maybe to types of counts model, where you think of counts as weighted edges, let's say, uh, and um, where the sampling actually um, is a kind of a cumulative count of in, uh, instantaneous edges that may actually occur between nodes. Um, okay, then the the second uh, paper uh, by Matteo and Mark. Um, well, uh, I, I had the kind of uh, fortune of being, in fact, the editor on the uh, on this particular paper when it was uh, being published. So. Uh, there was a special issue that was being made by the RSS um, in 2016-2017 on, uh, on uh, network modeling. And this paper was indeed submitted uh, to this particular special issue, and I was uh, the editor in that case. So I had the fortune of actually seeing this paper uh, when it was developing. Um, and, and we're clearly very pleased with, with the kind of impact it is having. Um, now, this, these type of dynamically involving edges, they are kind of special cases of so-called functional networks, um, which there are many types of uh, networks of. There's stochastic differential equations, ODEs, ordinary differential equations, um, where being part of the network means that uh, on the right-hand side of the equation, uh, a, a particular type of uh, X appears uh, to affect the uh, the value of the thing on the left-hand side. So in your functional assignment, basically, you'll see the presence or absence of a link. Uh, that is uh, particularly used in this kind of, in this paper, it was mentioned the vector order regressive model uh, as a ways of actually modeling um, these kind of functional relationships. Um, 
and the dynamic factor model, uh, which was another type of model that actually is used in order to kind of, again, describe a low um, dimensional or uh, a kind of um, um, structure that actually uh, powers the underlying dynamics. Um, now, in this particular case, I think uh, just to kind of uh, try to summarize the whole paper in the kind of the most essential part. So uh, what you indeed have is that the stock prices, I just take stocks, maybe I should say returns, that's probably better, uh, have this kind of uh, low dimensional dynamic factor model on the on one hand and this kind of vector uh, moving average model on the, on the other hand. Um, and the idea is that this vector moving average kind of captures the systemic contagion part of what is going on. And it's indeed written in this kind of infinite uh, um, way, infinite um, kind of uh, frame in, in which basically we have these innovations and these impulse response uh, coefficients that, uh, that, that drive what is going on. Um, now the kind of issues there is that uh, that the, rather than modeling this this particular D of M directly, uh, it actually kind of goes to a vector order regressive description of the actual process uh, because we can move between a vector order regressive part and the move uh, the vector moving average part by kind of inverting one to the other. Um, then model this vector order regressive par, uh, part in a sparse way. Now I have some questions, why sparse? Why do you want to do sparse? It was mentioned to do it computationally. Uh, there was some hint that perhaps this may also be ontologically. And when I say ontologically, what I mean is basically maybe there is an underlying sparse structure uh, or not uh, that actually drives some of this dynamics. Um, or perhaps the is it the predictive parsimony that actually may help you in order to kind of uh, put a sparse uh, VAR. Um, so yeah, that's, it's kind of a question to ask uh, to the uh, to the author. Um, the other part is the kind of remaining the V part that you actually see. That's the the kind of the third uh, network uh, that is there. Uh, that is being determined by this kind of um, partial correlation network, what he calls the PCN. Um, but given that this is uh, kind of this instantaneous interaction, uh, perhaps uh, you could model this using some kind of causal directed acyclic graph kind of approach in which you uh, do the uh, estimation of the uh, order of the variables, if you believe that there is such an order, by means of uh, causal inference, um, and which would be quite a uh, natural one to do if, if you somehow believe that uh, that the, the, the underlying uh, structure indeed is a network and has some kind of uh, ontological interpretation. Uh, finally, uh, which was also mentioned briefly, there is this kind of comparison between the overall period 2000 to 2013 with the period 2007-2008. Um, and the only way we can do this comparison is by actually fitting the model twice, uh, which means that you just restrict yourself to the data of 2007, 2008 in order to get the uh, effectively the VMA for that particular period. Um, whereas uh, it would be maybe more natural to try to see if it's possible to actually model this in a kind of a, a temporal way directly. So could it, be, could it be done? Now clearly in general may be quite challenging because of the dimensionality of the problem, but in principle, would, could it be possible to kind of model the dynamic structure maybe in a continuous way directly? Um, so that's what I would like to, what, what I wanted to mention, given the time, it's uh, probably uh, already quite a bit. I, I just finished by mentioning the fact that uh, uh, for the last four and a half years, we've had the um, kind of an European network, which was called CostNet. And uh, the CostNet network, it's it's recently, it was about to finish. Um, hopefully there is a follow-up to this, um, maybe called Edges, which is uh, the application lies in Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, the CostNet uh, collaboration has made a number of videos uh, to kind of explain all kinds of dynamic and, and also non-dynamic network modeling and statistics um, uh, through a series of uh, videos that, that can be found on YouTube. Um, so if you look for uh, CostNet um, and then your favorite videos, or if you're interested, let me know. We have a total of eight videos that we've produced in the past uh, couple of years that might give you an introduction to uh, this field, this general field, and, and maybe give you an idea of what is uh, uh, what are the kind of main issues when, it, uh, when, you, when it comes to modeling. 
So I'll, I'll stop right here. Thanks very much, Ernst. It's a, it's a really good discussion. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so first thing, we will extend. We, we said this webinar will finish at 3.15 UK time, but we are now extending it to 3.30 p.m. UK time. So we have eight more minutes. Um, before we open the discussion to the floor, I may, maybe I guess it's time for Catherine and Matteo to, to briefly address the questions Ernst asked in, during the, the presentation. Um, who wants to go first? Oh, okay, I, I can go first and quick maybe. Uh, uh, so there are many questions. Maybe I want uh, I want to address them all. But um, I wanted to say that the the question of the of the type of data uh, that you really collect, uh, I think it's really important because uh, Ernst mentioned that uh, I work on snapshots on of data, and most of the time these snapshots uh, they are constructed uh, by aggregation. Of, um, of, uh, of individual interactions uh, that are very, um, very pointwise interaction. If it's a phone call or an email uh, sent uh, between two people, that's really uh, a pointwise interaction. And we, we, most of the time, we aggregate them uh, to create those snapshots. And here, when you do this aggregation, you lose a lot of information. And uh, the question of choosing uh, the time window for this aggregation is also crucial. Uh, it might be uh, uh, the statistical question of the specifics of the data, but it's not always the case uh, that you have a natural choice for this. And so uh, I would like to mention that there are also uh, other types uh, of statistical models dedicated to this, uh, this uh, data, these uh, dynamic uh, interactions that are really pointwise and they are viewed as, uh, as uh, point processes uh, on, the, on the one that I mentioned all uh, a row of time. And, and I think they are more appropriate uh, for, this, uh, for the analysis of this type of data and that you should not aggregate uh, when it's possible uh, and use the raw data uh, instead. Well, and just uh, a few words, very brief. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, uh, keep the, the 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 speech, and it's not a good idea. So, uh, just very brief on the identifiability. We have provided uh, uh, sufficient conditions, and in fact, the question of uh, whether they are necessary or whether we we could have other conditions for for, uh, for identify identifiability of the parameters, which would be different and maybe uh, less uh, less constraining. It's really an open and interesting question. And that's all. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Ma Ma Matteo, uh, I'm not yes. saying... Just, yeah, go, go yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ernst. A very, very nice discussion. I like the whole uh, umbrella to the, the whole uh, two works together. Um, well, I've seen that there's not much time. So you have basically three three questions. The first one is why sparse VAR? Well, quick answer, short answer is computational issues. Um, let's say that uh, from a forecasting point of view, uh, we've seen at least in macroeconomics, not on this data, honestly, uh, it, it doesn't really help. And my feeling is that uh, univariate would be enough, but then there is no network and univariate is a big approximation. Then the next step, it would be sparse. And in fact, at the beginning, we were just doing lasso. If I remember correctly, was the referee suggesting to do something like elastic net or group lasso. And uh, it turns out that we decided to use elastic net because it's less unstable. Uh, Lasso is much more stable. Uh, I mean, the results more or less are similar, but you know, you, you don't want something so unstable. So I'm I'm not a big fan of Lasso, to be honest. So elastic net was a, was a good uh, good. Uh, good choice in the end. And uh, from an ontological point of view, well, from the point of view of the factor model, which is actually a representation result for infinite dimensional panels, you all you know is that there is weak dependence in time and in cross-section among idiosyncratic component. Any other assumption is an assumption that you have to put on top. I longly tried to see, for a long time, tried to see if I could find any implication for sparsity directly from the model, from the factor model. 
but it's not so easy because one deals with the uh, with the second moments and the other one deals with inverse second moments and the mapping is not so there. You you find bounds but always on the wrong side of the bound, so that doesn't really help. So in the end, we decided to put an assumption, but for computational reasons mainly. So you can, uh, and I wanted to keep it uh, less as less sparse as possible, not to lose uh, uh, too much information. Uh, second point, uh, yes, good point. I didn't think about it. I cannot say anything else, but I didn't think about it, but it's a it's really good point. Thank you. And the last one, <clears throat> uh, for the common part, we did it. We have it. We have all the results, so it's possible. For the large VAR with time varying again, time varying lasso exists, but you already have to pick the, the bandwidth uh, for the lasso. Now you will have to pick a bandwidth for the, for the, for the kernel. It's all doable. We didn't do it. Computational can be very intensive, but definitely there must be some more uh, uh, time dependence uh, allowed for. I agree. And uh, as usual, when uh, you reread the paper, your, your own papers for after some years, you realize you could have done better. But anyway, <laughs> for next next research. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, we have two minutes. I, I'm sorry, I, I really need to pay attention to the time. So let the uh, audience talk. Um, any questions? Does anyone want to say something? Just re 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 press the hand button uh, or you can type here if you are not very comfortable. Just, um, yeah. Um, Right, so while we are, oh, okay. Um, oh, I thought that's a question. Uh, thank you, thank you for the attending. Um, just just a very quick comment, actually, because you're talking about the VAR with the time variant. Like so, so, okay, I, I'm not selling myself, but I actually have a paper recently. It's, it's about the change point of VAR. So it's not a time varying completely uh, with different mm -hmm. time, but uh, you, we have a change point. Definitely within segments, you have different VR, so, so yeah. Yeah, that could be a good good approach. Instead of having a continuous time varying object, something where you look for change points, that, uh, that that's probably a more parsimonious way to go, yes. It's kind of, it kind of easier uh, than yeah, it's, thing, it's, you know, changing all the time. Uh, I actually noticed Mark, Mark is here too. Um, um, I saw him at a certain point. I don't know if he's still around, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I think Noah is asking more questions or raise hands. Uh, so, so it's really for the time issue. Uh, so it's a very interesting webinar. It's very interesting. I, I want to talk more, but uh, I should, I think as a chair, I, I should kind of close it. So, okay. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, a special thank you to to Judith and Teresa and uh, wh whoever from RSS. Uh, RSS. Uh, without them, really, we can't really have this very interesting. And of course, there are a lot of uh, other questions we want to discuss more, and we can do it offline. And uh, thank you very much for catching Ernst. And oh, that's a very nice slide to to con con conclude. And Matteo, um, I this both papers I read before, and uh, revisiting them definitely have some 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 new thoughts. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all for now. And uh, happy holidays um, if we are not talking to each other before the holidays. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Organization.